Hello, and welcome to our weekly dialogue with Helga Zepp LaRouche. She's the founder and chairwoman of the Schiller Institute. It's the 27th of September, 2023. I'm Harley Schlanger, and I'll be your host today. If you have questions or comments for us, you can send them to us at questions at schillerinstitute.org. Helga, there's been a growing recognition internationally that the NATO-backed uh, counteroffensive by Ukraine has not gone as planned. And as the casualties increase, uh, there have been calls for a peaceful resolution through diplomacy, more calls for that, uh, as urged by four prominent Germans, for example, in a peace plan published on August 28th. But there are also calls in the other direction for an escalation. Uh, the London Economist magazine called for a rethink, saying that the West has to plan for, a, quote, a long struggle, unquote. And just yesterday, the British royal think tank Chatham House had a discussion, uh, a podcast, chiding the West for inadequate support and called for, quote, a redoubling of efforts, unquote. Now, some such as Gilbert Doctor are describing this as NATO's plan B. That is an escalation, including the targeting of the Russian Black Sea Fleet in Crimea, which was hit twice over the weekend by missiles from the West. What are your thoughts about the direction this is heading? Uh, are Washington and NATO committed to moving toward a plan B? Well, that is very difficult to be 100% certain uh, about, but unfortunately all the signs are in the direction uh, that that may be the case because, you know, I can only uh, highlight the uh, proposal you mentioned from these four Germans. Uh, these were <clears throat> um, Horst Telschick, former head of the Munich Security Conference and top diplomat in the time of the German unification, General Kujat, formerly <clears throat> highest uh, military in Germany and leading position in NATO in the NATO Military Committee, uh, the son of Willy Brandt, Peter Brandt, and Professor Funke. And that proposal <clears throat> uh, made that choice very, very clear. Uh, this was published already end of uh, August, and it says that, you know, very soon NATO will be faced with a decision of either recognizing the fact that the military operation in Ukraine failed and the counteroffensive of Ukraine also. And that leaves only two, two, two options. One is uh, immediately negotiations for a diplomatic solution. And secondly, an escalation which quickly may bring the world to the level of a nuclear catastrophe. Uh, and then it is a very detailed, very appropriate uh, proposal how such peace negotiations could actually take place. Now, I think that that is indeed the choice. And the article you mentioned by uh, Gilbert Doktorov, uh, who is convinced that such a plan B uh, is already uh, in function, namely that you know the general gossip or you know line that you know okay ukraine is lost so let's move on uh, to the next confrontation with china over taiwan which apparently is the discussion in in washington and elsewhere uh, that that however is not what is happening uh, but that indeed we are seeing uh, an escalation you know where the NATO is uh, basically positioning itself to increasingly make the Black Sea uh, an area of confrontation with Russia directly. And naturally, the decision which uh, is reported by the uh, about the Biden administration that they will leave the so-called Ektekums missile, which have a range of 300 kilometers, and then following that would, you know, the decision be made uh, by the German government to send the Taurus cruise missiles, which have a range of 500 kilometers, uh, therefore being both capable of very far reaching into Russian territory, Crimea, or you know uh, whatever other areas be behind the uh, front lines. So that is where we seem to be at. There were these attacks on Sevastopol 
and you know, I mean, up to now, um, you know, it seems that Scholz is still hesitating to make the absolute commitment. But as things have gone for the last uh, one and a half years, the chance that he holds up and, and does not give the permission for the deployment of these Taurus cruise missiles, I'm not very confident at all. And, you know, it is a fact that, you know, uh, these cruise missiles uh, would be deployed, not one at the time, but it would probably be a whole, uh, you know, a whole group of them, which would basically mean that the supply line of continuous delivery of these Taurus missiles, which are being produced actually in Bavaria, uh, would be necessary. And that would clearly make Germany a war party in the conflict. And, you know, if uh, then things escalate to this, that point, you know, we could very quickly have military, uh, direct military confrontation between NATO and Russia involving Germany as a, as a country of departure of these missiles. So I think, you know, people better wake up. This, this is, I think this is going, in my view, completely wrong. I think the degree of mobilization of the population, of the awareness, uh, how dangerously close we are to a catastrophe is not there. It, that's naturally due to massive uh, campaigns of propaganda and disinformation in the mainstream media. But I think we are on that path. And I think it is it is absolutely uh, urgent that you know people really make their desire to be uh, heard that we absolutely need to have an immediate ceasefire as the Kuyat Telshik Funke Brand proposal is suggesting and that you know everybody must really rally around that proposal which in my view is the most accurate and the most uh, feasible uh, proposal on the table. And people can find that proposal on the SchillerInstitute.com. Uh, we have a press release on the uh, proposal for ending the war with a negotiated peace agreement. Now, naturally, given the, the tense situation that has developed, especially after the attacks last weekend on the Russian Black Sea fleet, uh, most of the questions we have have been on the Ukraine war. So let me start with one from a regular viewer, Menashe who writes about the Doctoro article on Plan B, and he said he has several questions, but the one I think that is uh, reflects a number of other questions I've gotten is how can the general public discern between reliable and unreliable sources of information? And this was also sent to me by someone who asked, can we believe what Seymour Hirsch is writing? And of course, Seymour Hirsch seems to be reflecting the same view as we've seen from Doctoro. So if you can take those two questions. Well, obviously, in a pre-war situation, which, you know, in part is already an actual war, but could be a pre-war to a large war situation, naturally the disinformation, black propaganda, gray propaganda is enormous. Um, so it is uh, obviously very difficult, but I, I think that one has to go by, first of all, the reputation of uh, the source. Uh, one has to see if one can verify it by, you know, checking it, see if there are other sources confirming the same thing. So it's a very difficult thing. But I, since you mentioned the Seymour Hirsch uh, new article, <clears throat> I would say, you know, use your own judgment because the facts which he, first of all, just for the audience, uh, Seymour Hirsch uh, wrote uh, an article at the occasion of the first anniversary of the Nord Stream bombing. And, you know, he had written this article a couple of months ago, which had created a complete bombshell because he had attributed the blame for the Nord Stream sabotage squarely to Biden personally. And that article was extremely accurate uh, in terms of detail, in terms of, you know, probability and, you know, also facts. So now he 
uh, naturally there was a whole effort to counter that with this ridiculous story about a Ukrainian yacht, the so-called Andromeda, which was a sailboat, which according to all military experts was completely un incapable of launching such a very difficult uh, sabotage in about 80 meter uh, deep below the sea. Uh, a sailboat simply does not have the kind of pressure temper for for people to, to dive, uh, a whole bunch of other uh, improbable uh, circumstances. Now Hirsch has written um, a new article which has new elements in it and I must say they're really hair-raising because he makes two arguments. One, um, <clears throat> that uh, he has again sources in the intelligence community in the United States um, who told him that it is as good as certain that Chancellor Scholz was told by Biden at this occasion of the press conference on February 7th in Washington or before that, that they would go ahead with the elimination of Nord Stream 2. And well, that's an accusation, but you know, I think it is so severe uh, in terms of what the implication of it is. Uh, I mean, if, if that's true, then Scholz would have completely violated his oath to prevent damage from the German people. I cannot say, you know, I mean, this is this amounts to cooperation with terrorism, a terrorist attack, uh, which is ruining the German economy to a degree you know, which is uh, only uh, unfolding uh, in, this, in this period where Germany is being halved in terms of industry. Now, as I said, it's, it's just an accusation, but it is so severe um, that, you know, I think it does merit an independent investigation. This is what China is demanding. That's what Russia is demanding. Many countries of the global south uh, insist on it, and it has not yet happened. So then the second major new point in Hirsch's uh, uh, statement <clears throat> is basically uh, the, you know, the accusation that <clears throat> the threat which Biden delivered at this press conference on February 7th, where he said, if the Russians intervene militarily in Ukraine, this was, you know, two weeks before they actually did, then uh, then uh, <clears throat> they would destroy the Nord Stream pipeline. Now, Hirsch again quotes uh, sources in the intelligence community in the United States to say that the decision to actually go ahead with the sabotage had nothing to do with the effort to prevent the war because the war started about two weeks later on the 24th of February and then the decision was not made uh, but the uh, crew who, were, who was in charge of uh, delivering this sabotage was told that they should be on hold and deliver this sabotage on demand. And <clears throat> that that was guided by the uh, effort by the Biden administration to, to judge, you know, what would be the blowback uh, of such an operation. Um, and then finally, they decided uh, to do it on the 26th of September, uh, after everything had been in place already before, in order to make sure that Germany had no option to, under pressure of the economic sanction and rising energy prices, that Germany would have no option to go back to the um, inexpensive gas deliveries by Russia, which would imply the danger that Germany would fall under the control of Russia and that the United States subsequent, subsequently would lose their dominant position in Europe. Now, again, that is an accusation, but think about it, you know, I mean, if, if it was true um, that it had to be a war uh, deterrence, you know, and, and he also quotes uh, Victoria Nuland, uh, of saying that they had repeated stern and firm discussions with the Germans to tell them, uh, you know, not not to go ahead with this Nord Stream. 
um, I mean, if it's true that they were holding this decision for several months and then decide, you know, when it was clear, and I remember quite vividly, that was at a point when, you know, the demonst demonstrations in East Germany and elsewhere were picking up on the demand to open Nord Stream 1 and 2 uh, because the gas prices became so incredibly uh, uh, expensive. And if that was then the answer to basically make sure that such demands would disappear from these demonstrations, I find this absolutely uh, incredible. And, 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 you know, given the fact that Hirsch in his article also uh, goes to great lengths to detail the uh, accurate uh, uh, revelations he has made in his career, it was published by the New York Times, the Washington Post, in other so-called mainstream media, um, I think it does require an investigation. And, you know, it. the Chinese argument, I think, is also very valuable because they say that if such an enormous uh, incident of attack, terrorist attack on infrastructure gets away with, uh, then no infrastructure in the world is safe. So there is a, a common international interest to get to the bottom of this, <laughs> this is no joke involved, uh, <clears throat> but you know that 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 is really a very severe matter, and I I really find it absolutely unbelievable that you know the German government uh, could possibly have done this, and that the German Parliament is too cowardly uh, to even investigate it, and that the German uh, criminal authorities, the state attorney office uh, that they would make themselves available to to come up with a cover story i find this you know since this is equivalent of 9 11 for for germany and you know th these are the kinds of developments which you know determine which way a country goes uh, this is not a light matter this is uh, you know touching upon the fundamental interest of germany as a nation on the question of sovereignty on the question of existence in terms of an industrial state. So I can only say, you know, we should really demand an, an impartial, objective investigation by everybody uh, who, who, who has any reason uh, to, to, to do so. And that's practically everybody. Now we have a question from Dennis from Russia, which I think is in part related to this whole push for negotiations. Uh, he writes that a, a, the idea of a compromise would include concessions from Russia, uh, but Russia is not going to return Crimea or the Donbass, uh, and they're concerned that there's been no international recognition of why the special military operation was launched. And so he said, rather than allowing the West to save face, uh, what makes you think such compromise could happen? Well, I think the only reason why I'm saying it is because there is no third option. Either you escalate the war, and that is what we are in the middle of, or you come to negotiations. And it is the nature of uh, diplomacy and negotiations that you have to find a compromise. And, you know, obviously, uh, the so called prehistory of the uh, military operation, special military operation. I mean, the idea that history started on the 24th of February, only a complete moron is sticking to it. And that there are some in the mainstream media working as journalists, that's for sure. But it is an established fact that the entire history after the collapse of the Soviet Union has to be taken into account. I mean, the fact that uh, that Russia granted sovereignty uh, to Ukraine in 91 was based on the fact that uh, Ukraine would remain a neutral country. That's a, uh, you know, a fact which, which is completely neglected. It's not just the promises given to Gorbachev, not one inch uh, NATO moves to the east that has been dismissed, but there are also time witnesses who, who absolutely uh, say the contrary. But I think this 91 uh, decision by Russia to allow uh, Ukraine to, to become a sovereign state was linked with the idea of neutrality. 
and that is that is also in 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 the verifiable facts so i think you know that needs to be a review of the entire history and it has to be objective and then i think the minsk 2 formula uh, is at least a reference point one should go back uh, because finally you know it, it the solution has to be one uh, which you know does take care of uh, the interest of everybody, and that includes emphatically you know the the population in in Russia, you, the population in Ukraine, the population in Donbas, the con con population in Crimea, and I think referendums uh, down the way will will definitely have to be a part. Um, but I think the key thing is that if you realize that we are really on the verge of a, that this is spinning out of control which threatens to be the end of humanity a ceasefire unconditional negotiations and then you know basically the recognition on both sides that the alternative is there is nobody left to judge who was guilty and who was not guilty should be a motivation uh, to enter diplomacy now, I think, you know, some people may think a military solution uh, is the only way. I think such people exist on both sides. But that does have the danger that it does not work. I mean, and, and this time the, the, um, the, the outcome would be not, not anything for anybody because nobody would be alive. So I think the only the only idea how I can think how we can get there is there has to be a public demand. Um, Germany, unfortunately, is uh, sleeping, sleepwalking into their own uh, destruction. The people in the United States are too indifferent. They don't get what's going on, not, not in anywhere sufficiently. And that's why I think that the only possible voice which can be made itself heard is the countries of the global south because if it comes to a nuclear war um, they will be as dead as everybody else and there are the big new factor um, you know they they represent the absolute vast majority of the human species and i think we have to get a debate and pressure coming not from the united states to the global south but the other way around well, speaking of a review of history, the, the other big story, and by the way, let me remind you, you're watching Helga Zepp LaRouche of the Schiller Institute, and this is our weekly dialogue, and you can send questions still at questions at schillerinstitute.org. So going back to this question of re reviewing history, uh, I've received many emails from Canadian supporters about the event which took place at the Canadian Parliament, where in front of President Zelensky and uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, a standing ovation, in fact, two standing ovations were given to someone who was described as a Canadian and Ukrainian war hero, who turned out to be a veteran of Ukraine's 14th division of the Galician Waffen SS, that is a Nazi unit of Ukrainian volunteers that engaged in genocide against especially uh, people from Poland. Now, some wrote for, of, of their embarrassment that this could happen in Canada, Others said it shows a level of ignorance, not knowing that someone who is introduced as a Ukrainian fighting Russia in World War II, well, who is fighting against Russia in World War II? It was the Nazis. And then Trudeau today came out and said, uh, sort of issued an apology, not really, but he warned Canadians to be on the lookout for, quote, Russian disinformation, unquote. Helga, what are your thoughts on this affair? Uh, well, I think it's um, it's very revealing, and I think it, you know, in in one sense it's good because it's uh, it shows very clearly that the demonization of Russia and the Russophobia, which has turned into a unbelievable hatred against everything Russian, is blinding a lot of people to such a degree that just because somebody is anti-Russia, he is regarded as a hero. Now, in this case, it turns out that it was a verifiable uh, SS uh, member 
uh, who the Polish government is accusing of having been involved in massive killing of Polish uh, people. Uh, now, you know, the fact that these things could go through, I mean, uh, there were there, there were also questions to the German parliament uh, to the German government coming from uh, parliamentarian of the left on you know similar things in Ukraine and the German government position was uh, we have no knowledge of we do not take these arguments that there is anti-Semitism or racism uh, so they're completely denying it. Now, if Canada has a blind eye, if the German government has a blind eye, and the United States government has a blind eye, the British for sure, the question arises is what is it in the structure and in the makeup of these Western governments which makes it so easy, convenable, convenient, convenient for them, you know, to, to ignore these facts? Well, I think the answer is not so pleasant for these Western governments because maybe there is an affinity between their goals and what you know these uh, <coughs> Nazi elements represent. Now, I think we are looking at the danger of fascism in the West, and I think anybody who is uh, you know not falling for the propaganda will see that very clearly. That if you know if if we are not changing quickly. You know, we are in absolute danger, not only to repeat the danger of the mistake of World War I by sleepwalking into a catastrophe, but also the, you know, horrors of the Second World War and a new fascism. It will not be the Nazi fascism as it was in Germany 80 or so years ago, but it will be, if you look at what the West is doing under the pretext of democracy and human rights, I mean, if you make an honest account of what are these policies, well, maybe this question of the Canadian incident starts a review of Western policy, and that would be the best possible outcome. Now, Helga, here's a question from uh, a, someone who describes herself as a concerned patriot. She asks, how can singing classical pieces in a chorus stop insane war hawks from making war? Well, I don't think it will do that uh, because these war hawks are war hawks and they have made their decision to, to be what they are. But the purpose of classical music is to uplift the general population. I mean, look, when we are... <clears throat> right now in a situation where i mean the west as a as a entity you know meaning the united states and europe in particular we have the biggest cultural crisis i can think of it's a plunge into decadence decadence which makes the end of the roman empire pale by comparison but if you look at the what is allowed under the flag of uh, you know democracy and, and freedom and whatnot i mean the violence the absolute the, the i think there were 500 mass shootings in the united states so far this year uh, an unbelievably high number of deaths coming from these uh, shootings then you look at the uh, suicide rate you look at the drug addiction uh, the violence of the drug gangs in the cities, the, the decay, you know, of infrastructure, the, the barbarism which is portrayed in in the way uh, migrants are treated, both in the United States and in in Europe around the Mediterranean. I mean, this is the downfall of the West. Don't kid yourself. <clears throat> and you know, my late husband Lyndon Larouche always used to say that a society which is not capable of classical thinking anymore will not make it <clears throat> because with classical music you are um, you know you are you're, you are appealing to that in the inner soul of a human being which is human which is beautiful which is creative which is uplifting which is lofty which you know has all the ideals of humanity and, you know, therefore, I think the only way how we can have any hope to get back on, on a track of peace and, and, and decency in the world order 
is that we have to revive the classical traditions in Western culture. Classical music is the absolute key because it is the international language which is understood by everybody. And, you know, I think that that lifting up of the human spirit is the absolute, un, um, you know, unavoidable uh, precondition for us to get out of this. So it's not the Warhawks, it's the rest of the population which needs to be uplifted. Well, in that, I, I have a, a final question for you, and you can some, do, use this as a summary. It's from AJ, I believe, in the, uh, in the, uh, from the uh, internet. Uh, can you see the end of this global conflict? What can ordinary people do to bring peace? I've been sharing the, the truth, but it's difficult to say if it, I'm making friends or losing friends. Well, those you lose under these circumstances, it's better not to have them uh, and you will gain new ones. Um, I think that despite the extreme danger, uh, and I think we should not for one second forget it and downplay it, I think there is hope. Um, you know, for example, the Chinese government just has published a white paper on their conception of a, so a community of a shared future of humanity. This is a notion which has been used by Xi Jinping, I think going back all the way to 2013. And it has been elaborated uh, in various uh, speeches and so forth. And now they have produced a, I think, almost 40 page paper, which I have not yet totally read. But from what I have read, I can say it is really very, very hopeful because it states emphatically that the idea of, um, you know, the new system of, you know, which consists of such organizations as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, the new economic system, it is open to everybody emphatically. It is not meant to replace the West or to be in competition to the West, but it is an invitation to all countries to work together uh, for a shared future of humanity. And I think that that is very important that it comes out so strongly from the Chinese uh, at this moment of grave danger, because, you know, it, it, it uh, makes geopolitics uh, obviously a lie, because geopolitics is based on the idea that you always will have to defend your interest against the interest of somebody else. That's a bestial con condition. Already several years ago, I made it my New Year's resolution calling for the absolute overcoming of geopolitics as a, as a great evil. No, what we have to do is we have to move to a new paradigm where international relations will be among equal sovereign states, um, where each state respects the sovereignty of the other does not interfere in the internal affairs of the other country, respects their different pathway. Different cultures have different ideas of how they want to organize their state and they should be permitted to do so. The idea to bring democracy with cannons and, and, and aircraft carriers just has clearly not worked. Look at Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, the tragedy of Libya, you know, which is now suffering from this uh, so-called natural catastrophe, which was not a natural catastrophe, because if NATO would not have bombed the dams, uh, which were, you know, brought in good shape by, by Gaddafi, and which were supposed to be restored uh, and, and repaired, a work which has completely stopped since the killing of Gaddafi, obviously, I mean, I could go on for a very long time. The idea of interventionist wars did not work. We have to move to a system of respecting the sovereignty of each and all. And, you know, the idea of the dominance of one country, that's over. Uh, I mean, that has been the big issue at the United Nations General Assembly, where many, many countries from many leaders from countries which are not that strong 
Nevertheless, they said, you know, the idea that one country can uh, push others around is over and we, we demand a new system of equal relations, of international relations based on the UN Charter, based on the five principle of peaceful coexistence. You know, and I have my own ideas. I have written um, 10 principles for a new international security and development architecture, which I really urge everybody to read and distribute and talk about it because we are at a branching point of human history where either we can make that jump or we will you know not make it so be happy and work with us well helga i know i'm speaking for many of our viewers in thanking you for joining us again in fact there's a, an email from one of them who said uh, to tell Helga, thank you for your optimism. Hearing you each week lifts me off the floor and inspires me to try again to talk to my deadheaded friends. So with that, Helga, see you again next week. Till next week and get active with us in the meantime.